Today I'm going to be talking about converting the roads and highways advanced LRS to a routable network for network analysts. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about the ArcGIS platform, where roads and highways fits. Uh, we'll talk about roads and highways, just a brief overview, a brief overview of network data sets. I'm going to talk about how you would manage your events to go into um, the network data set. We'll talk about the process of actually converting the events to an, converting the LRS to a network data set. I'll talk about how you would manage turn restrictions. And we'll show you, I'll show you at the end how to use the network once it's been created. What, what apps can actually leverage it. So I'm kind of coming into this with some, making some assumptions that you're somewhat familiar with roads and highways and that you're familiar with net, or somewhat familiar with network data sets. You may not know all the details about them, um, but we'll cover enough to show you what the process is to make this possible. So roads and highways is part of the ArcGIS platform. Um, it supports mapping, analysis. Uh, we can integrate it with other business systems. We can present the data in various web applications, um, collector. Um, we can manage that data through a relational database, serve out services. So roads and highways is part of the platform. And we can take advantage of that and leverage the ability to take the, the event data that we maintain and push that into a network data set, which is what I'm going to be highlighting, how we make that jump. So roads and highways, as you just saw in Tom's demo before, um, roads and highways is the system of record for any DOT's asset, asset, um, asset cycle. So we maintain all of, our, all of our assets, whether it's pavement data, functional class, speed limit lanes, all of that information is is stored and lives in roads and highways. It is the system of record of that data. And it allows me to maintain one unified center line. In addition, what a lot of people don't realize is that roads and highways also supports the ability to store and maintain address ranges, address blocks and address ranges, and address, point, address points as well. I can maintain my road inventory, all of my projects, my signs, and then I can also route against that data and geocode against it. And we access the events through um, the, the uh, event editor, which is an easy to use interface. It's, it's, um, it's configurable and I can have multiple configurations of my event editor to target my different users. And so it allows me to integrate all these different silos of data so that I can unlock the capabilities in ArcGIS. So you're here to see how we unlock the network. So the network data set supports simple to complex route analysis, right? It's gonna allow me to generate and define and locate simple routes. I've gotta get from X and I gotta to go to Y. What's the best route to get there? Or in the case of optimized routes, I've got 20 inspectors they're gonna go out and, man and, and inspect high mass light poles, and this is the list of light poles that each inspector has. What's the best route for each inspector to take? I can do service analysis, service drive time analysis, uh, vehicle routing, location allocation. So in the case of my, my inspectors, I can analyze their, their work areas to determine if they're balanced, if each worker has enough work to do and if the routes that they're going to take are generally equal so to maximize who I'm sending out and where. Um, the vehicle routing problem lets me uh, again figure out if I'm doing service deliveries what side of the street I want to pull up on. I always want to pull up on the right side and that might even be the case with your inspectors. You might want them to pull up on the certain side of the street and you want to make sure that they're arriving at their um, location safely. We can also pull traffic into this data as well and then begin to analyze the best time of day. So 
if I'm, if I'm going to the airport at LAX, now is not the best time of day to do that. What is the best time of day? Maybe I want to set my flight to get to the airport later tonight so that I'm not going to run into the same traffic that I would run into right now. So those are just some of the problems we can solve. So the network data set, in order to get a network data set, we have to have line data, and then the network data set is going to generate uh, nodes or points for each intersection along the route. It will, it will basically keep track of how every edge or line connects to each other. In addition, there's a third layer called a turn layer. And the turn layer can be allowable, permitted turns, or it could be restricted turns, so turn restrictions. No left turns at Main Street and Elm. Um, or no U-turns citywide. I live in Columbus, Ohio, and there are no U-turns citywide. So I have to have a way of maintaining that so that I can keep track of of basically when I'm routing my workers, where they're allowed to turn and where they're not. Um, so when we, when we load this data into a network data set, connectivity is established. Um, endpoint, every vertex or every line's end has a node on it. Every vertex where you've got an intersection has nodes. We maintain Z elevation on our data, so when I have an interstate crossing a local street, say with an overpass, it doesn't mistakenly turn right down the local street off the interstate where there's no ramp. So we maintain elevation to keep track of what is the overpass and what is the underpass, and I'll show you that. And then there's connectivity groups. Connectivity groups are hierarchy, essentially. So that would be your functional class. Your functional class determines the hierarchy of your road. So I'll use that functional class to help me maintain those connectivity groups and what's allowed to connect and what's not. And then we can add attributes or costs. So for instance, speed limit allows me to generate a cost to travel across the route. So when you see the time get generated when you get your driving directions from your house to the airport, it's factoring in the speed limits to generate a time that it should take you to get to that location. So I'll use speed limit as a component of my routing data to get me my uh, cost. I can also add, as I mentioned, my turn, turn restrictions as a restriction to the network. So it knows it can't take a left where a left turn is not permitted or it can't make a U-turn where U-turns aren't allowed. Um, hierarchy, again, would, would factor in to play with the connectivity groups and functional class. So that hierarchy is your functional class. And then from that, we generate our directions. And Network Analyst does all of this. So when I apply the lines and I establish the connectivity rules, Network Analyst is going to do the rest. The key is how do you get your data from roads and highways to the network? And that's what we're going to really focus on here. So, We've got our route ID, our route and measures, and for, for the simplicity of this, of this uh, example, we're gonna call this route Elm, and you can see it is intersected by Pine and A Avenue, and it goes from zero to 0.66 mi uh, miles. In addition, I have my events, so I've got speed limit, I've got my address block ranges, and I've got my one-way streets, and there might be others. Like I said, you might have functional class, you're gonna have uh, turn restrictions, you're gonna have overweight, oversized. There might be multiple factors that play into this. So the bottom line is, I've gotta take all of this data, and I need to merge this together in order to pass it into a network, into a network data set. Because network data sets don't know about events. And since Roads and Highways maintains events as features, we'll use the Overlay Route Events tool that's part of the Roads and Highways linear referencing tools. So that will take all of my event data that I choose and merge it together and, and segment the data where we have these differences. So you'll see here, we have a gap in this route. We're gonna have a difference in this route where 
one section from Pine Avenue to 0.22 miles is 25 miles an hour and then it's gonna change. So when I run overlay route events, what we'll have is Elm Street from, from zero, to point, uh, zero to 99 on the addressing will be 25 miles an hour and null, meaning it doesn't have a one-way street. And then from 100 to 125, it's gonna be 25 miles an hour, but it's also gonna switch over to one way. So the FT indicates that it's from the, the start to the end of that segment, it is one way. If it were TF, then it would be from the end to the start, one way. And then the same goes here. We see that on this section of Elm, the um, address block ranges continue to increase and the, um, the speed limit changes, but it remains one way. And then at, at um, A Street, it changes to be 200 to 299 and 35 miles an hour and no one way anymore. So the network data set's gonna take all this data and merge it together. That's the key. So, what other events can I add into the overlay route events tool? So we mentioned, we mentioned the address block range, we mentioned one ways, we mentioned speed limit. You could pull in lanes, we could pull in overweight, oversized, hazardous materials, functional class, there's probably others out there too that we could add in. But those are just some of the examples of events that I can add in and model. Now you'll notice here, I don't have turn restrictions. In event editor, I can't have a line span two routes as an event. So for roads and for, for network for the network data set, I'm gonna have to maintain turn restrictions separately, and I'll show you how I handle that. So we'll come back to turn restrictions in a little bit. All right. So I put together a tool and I'm gonna be sharing this on GeoNet next week. Um, so the tool looks like this. So overlay route events is gonna take in my network, my LRS network as an input, my address block ranges, my functional class. Here, let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. So it's gonna take the address block range, the functional class, the speed limit, one-way streets, road elevation. I can add others in, right? So. So we can easily modify this and add other events. So if I have all my height restrictions, all my weight, my weight restrictions, I can add those events in to this tool and have it process them out into one center line. So the overlay route events tool will take all of those events, merge them together, create one center line, and then I'm gonna do some processing to the center line. Um, the featured align tool, it makes sure that all of my intersections are split at the intersection points. Um, and it gives me planarized lines. And then I make sure everything's snapped. I wanna make sure that everything coming out of roads and highways is snapped together when I merge it into a network data set. Um, and then once it's all snapped, there are a couple fields I don't maintain, a couple system fields. And again, if, if you need to modify this to meet your needs, that's fine. But in my case, I had four or five fields that were irrelevant to me. I didn't need to maintain them, so I took them out. Um, let me see, yeah, so um, the, so all the, um, all, the net, all the route fields, I didn't really need those. The referent methods, I didn't need any of those fields. Um, so there were probably about Basically, the fields I needed to, to keep were the address ranges, the street names, the, um, the prefix, the suffix, um, state routes, interstates, the functional class, which comes in from 
the, um, which comes in from my functional class event layer, um, the speed limit, and my one ways, and then my elevation data. All those are the only things that I maintain in the outbound feature class. So once my schema matches, then I just delete the old center lines and append in the new ones from the network data set. So this is pointing at center lines in my network data set. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And then finally, I rebuild my network. So rebuilding the network checks the connectivity between all the edges and all the nodes. So that network looks like this. So you can see that here's my LRS, all my events, my um, LRS layer, my intersections, all that data gets processed by the create route of, or create um, overlay events, um, the overlay events tool. So the overlay events tool takes all the feature classes that I showed you in the model, processes those out as one center line. And what I generate is this. I generate one unified center line. And this is Franklin County, Ohio. Um, these are the nodes, so Network Analyst builds these nodes for me. I have no control over these. I can't go in and modify them. They are system nodes that are used to maintain the connectivity. Then I have my network, which has all the rules and the parameters, and I'll share these with you as well um, in a document. I'll take some screenshots of everything in these uh, panels. But essentially what I've done is it, it keeps track of my sources, so it knows about the center line layer. It knows about my turn restrictions. And it knows how all of my center lines connect to one another, my connectivity rules. It knows what fields maintain elevation. So the, the elevation data is coming from an event. And then the attributes define things like the time, the drive time. So the drive time, if I, if I show you this, it's basically a calculation that takes the length of any segment, divides it by a mile, multiplies that by the speed limit, and it gets me out to seconds. So it calculates how long it takes to traverse each segment of road by seconds. And so when it generates, when, when, when the network data set generates its driving directions, it will accumulate all of those segments to give me a time that I should be arriving at my destination. And I have that on the from to and the to from direction of every segment. It also knows what my turn restrictions are and how to handle those. It, it's using distance as feet. It's using my hierarchy, which is basically my functional class column. It's, it knows how to interpret all my one-way streets. It knows that the speed limit is a cost in minutes. So even though I generate the drive time in seconds, it calculates the speed limit cost in minutes. And then finally, the turn restrictions, it knows that it's not allowed to pass me down any road with the turn restriction. So if I have a no left, it will know how to honor that. And then you can set up travel modes in this as well. So right now I have a travel mode for a car. I could add others. So I could add, um, let's do um, truck. And then for the truck, I just specify a truck travel mode and I can specify that we don't allow U-turns and um, it knows to use my turn restrictions to prevent me from doing any U-turns by setting that no U-turns allowed. It knows to use the hierarchy and it knows to use my drive time as the main impedance. 
So you can set up different travel modes to calculate what it might take for, if you have trucks in your fleet, what's it gonna take for a truck in the fleet to get to a location versus somebody driving a car. So then once you've got all this set up, you'll build your network. And the first time you build the network, it takes a, it takes a while. When you're talking about a statewide network, my network for one county in Ohio takes about 30 minutes. So it's a long process, but once the network is built, whenever you start editing the network, it only ha you only have to build what you edit. So the builds from after the first time are much faster because it's only checking what was changed. <clears throat> Okay. Now, the turn restrictions. Turn restrictions are, are really tricky um, because in Network Analyst, I have to touch every edge that's, that's taking part in the turn restriction. So if I'm not allowed to make a left-hand turn, I have to touch this line and I have to touch this line, and I have to touch this node. So it's basically making an inverted L. And I have to do that for every line. So that's why I can't take an event from roads and highways. So I almost have to maintain these separately. And I put together a little web application to do that, and I'll show you that in a second. And then U-turns, I have to touch the edge, the node, and then the edge. And then the same thing for right-hand turns. The, the edge, the node, and the edge. So this is what the network, this is what the turn restriction table maintains. It keeps track of every single edge and how they connect. So it knows that um, in this particular turn, there are three edges participating. So 104, 102, and 103, and it keeps track of those IDs so it knows how to navigate and what IDs it's got to hit when it generates its driving directions. It's a pretty complex process under the hood. You can maintain up to 50 relationships, 50 different segments can be involved in a turn, up to. So by default, I think the uh, default turn table that gets generated has five edges that it allows. So you can add to that though if you find areas in your network where you've got really complex turns. So you can edit turn restrictions in ArcMap, but I also put together a little web application. So let's take a look. All right, so I've got a line and it basically, this road, it's a one-way road. It's a little one-way connector. So I can't turn right at this intersection. I have to get on this little berm and it dumps into New Albany Road East going one way. So I can't make a left turn here. This is a yield, it's a continuous turn. So if I wanna edit this turn restriction, I'm gonna grab my turn restriction feature I'm gonna to touch the edge, the junction, and this edge right here. And I'm gonna tell it that it's a no left. Now, the edit's made, but the web app builder doesn't support snapping. I put together a little app that is gonna run behind the scenes and take care of that for me. So I've got a little geoprocessing script that I've built into this little app that's going to take, and, and when I execute this, it's gonna find that segment, and it's gonna snap it, and of course it doesn't here. <laughs> so it looks like it failed. So what it would do is it takes this, this line, snaps it, and then rebuilds the, uh, and, it, and it adds it to the turn feature class, and it creates all those, um, all of those uh, edges, all of those edge, um, all of the edge behavior. 
so it knows what edges touch what. Let's just try that one more time. Okay. All right, so, so that's, so this little tool, or this web app, will allow me to build and maintain those turns. And over time, we can generate multiple turns. Um, we're looking at some ways to batch process this, although that's, I think, gonna be a tall order. I think it's a manual process to go in and edit and find all of your turns and maintain those over time. But um, you can see here, we've got multiple turn types. Um, here, this is a U, no U-turn. This guy is a no left or no right turn. We've got a no right turn. This no right turn is going from New Albany Road to um, actually that's a, should be a left. New Albany Road to New no, New Albany Road East to New Albany Road. Um, and then some of the other attributes I'm going to show you that came over from my. Um, network data set. So if I click on this guy, you'll see here, this is going right over the interstate. So this is an overpass. This is Harlem Road and it overpasses the highway. Down at the bottom here, you'll see from my event table, I've got this F elevation, T elevation, so from and to. So this is a one, this indicates that this line segment is higher than the line segments it's touching that it intersects. So when it routes me, it knows to maintain and not turn me left or right down these highways. And I maintain the events in Event Editor. So you can see here in Event Editor, here's that event I just showed you in um, the other application. So when I run the overlay route events tool, it knows how to take this segment and add it into the network feature class. And it knows that this is an overpass. So it knows that this feature is an overpass, it knows how to handle it, and, um, and it shows up here with the from two, and it, or for, with the elevation of one, so it knows that that's that's a higher segment than the segments below it. And then here you can see all my one ways. These are events that I use to maintain all of my one way streets. You can see for this segment, it's going from this intersection to the end point of this, of this where it dumps into the highway. Here's another one. It's a, again, from to relationship. So from this point, to this end point here. So that's where my one way is and it, and it knows how to maintain that. And then finally, what I get at the end is I have this web app that has my route network built into it. So I'll go ahead and I'll locate my address. So this, this little application is using that network. And so I'm gonna generate my driving directions to the post office. Oh, come on.
Oh, something's going on with my network. Something's going on here. All right, so these are live web applications. When I post all this, I'm gonna post everything I built out to GeoNet to the transportation um, group. So you'll go out to the GeoNet community. And um, go to the, you'll go to the um, Departments of Transportation. Just do a search on Departments of Transportation, and I'll have all the tools posted out here early next week along with links to the web applications so you can test this out. I'll have all these web applications up and running and live, and I'll figure out whatever's going on here with this. Um, I made a few modifications late, which I knew I shouldn't have done. So uh, probably impacting this. So we'll, um, I'll have this live next week so you can go out and test it, but that's the general workflow, yes. Uh, the situation you have where you have these overpasses, uh, in the network, a node is basically a place where you can possibly go from one uh, edge to another. But in an overpass, in the case of an overpass, there are no possible turns. So wouldn't it be better, rather than adding turn restrictions, to actually eliminate the node? You can't eliminate the All right, so you, you can eliminate the node wherever it crosses, wherever two segments intersect. So in the case of my overpass, it intersects the highway. I can't remove that. All I can do is set up the elevation field to maintain that relationship so it knows not to route me down those interstates. Does that make sense? I'm sorry. Be the nodes maintain the connectivity to all the other segments around it. So if I delete that node, it's going to delete those segments that touch it. Right. That's not going to happen in, right. That's right. You, you can't have planar and non-planar segments together. They're all intersected. And then I have to maintain the rules. Uh, any other questions? Yes. The question was, do I have to manually go in and define all my turn restrictions? And the answer is yes. I mean, editing a network is a, it's a big job. And there's, <laughs> creating a network out of roads and highways is fairly easy, but maintaining that network long term is a big undertaking. That's, that's primarily why a lot of people go out and buy that data, because of the, the amount of work that goes into maintaining it. 
and establishing all those rules and those relationships. Yes? Can you repeat the first part of that? I heard the ABL. Yeah. Yeah. So the the question was, can I take data from an AVL that we're tracking vehicles as they travel down any given segment and use that information to figure out how long it actually takes to get through turns? And the answer to that is yes. We can take that data and apply it to a traffic layer that basically maintains those average times. So, you know, if I've... It, it's model as an average turn time. What's that? That's right. Now, now, I will say this. You can pass in a feature class to your turntable. So if you've got those averages that it's take, so if, if I have, you know, for any given major intersection, so let's say I've got a thousand vehicle tracks that go across that turn. I can take that, that vehicle, those vehicle tracks and basically com aggregate them together to come up with an average turn time. And then I can pass that into my turntable and that field can get mapped to an average turn time field in my turn restrictions or in my permitted turns and that would give me that time it takes to get across that that turn so you can do that I don't have to I don't have to I can import restrictions so if I have restrictions out there I can import them into a restrictions layer and then I can maintain my own fields in addition to the ones that Arc that ArcGIS maintains for me so all the edge connectivity, those are required, but you can also add your own and then pull those in and have the network data set um, interpret those. So the average turn time would be one that I could interpret. Any other questions? Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Okay, so the question was, how do I how do I model turns that are restricted during certain times of day? So, you know, in the morning we may have no left turns and then in the afternoon we have no left turns on certain streets. So in my in my connectivity rules For my network, so in the attributes, on the restrictions, I can create an evaluator. And in the evaluator, I'm using a constant right now. I could use a script. And then in the script, I can write a SQL query that says between this time and this time and this time and this time, we don't allow these terms. And that's how it would evaluate whether or not it can make a restriction at that point in time. Yes? Yeah, you can import a traffic history. Um, you can also import signs so that when you generate your directions, it will use, it will, it will generate on the fly signs telling you where you get off and where your turn is and 
what direction, what lane to get into. So you can model that as well. That starts to really get intense when you start adding that data in on top of everything else. Now this is more or less at get, get off on exit 204 on interstate I-10 and it shows a sign in the directions with exit 204, I-10 and then the arrow pointing to the right. Now, I could, through symbology, show that, you know, during a certain time of day, we don't allow that traffic to pass. All right. Um, so, again, I will put all this information out on the web, out on GeoNet on Monday, and, um, and I'll put a post out there as well explaining, you know, all the work, how we did this, and um, in a blog, and you guys can download it, make use of it. And um, if you're interested in talking to us further about it, we'd be happy to get together with you in a web, in a web meeting or something like that, or on site and talk through this process. So thanks again.